One of the most important moves for the New Orleans Saints this offseason is going to be retaining restricted free agent tight end Jawan Johnson. How can they get it done? We got all of that and a little bit of land yap for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints. Part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much as always. Make it Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget we're free and available on all podcast apps and on YouTube as well. And I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. Your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, CrescentCitySports.com, USA Today, Saints Wire, Tuesdays a lot in NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. In today's episode of Locked On Saints brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the M- of the NFL. Make every moment more more by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Tell you more about them later. On today's episode, we're taking a look at HPCU Combine standouts, two particular over on the offense and places where the New Orleans Saints could use a little bit of juice. Before we get to that, we'll also take a look at franchise tag candidates for the New Orleans Saints and how there aren't any but what are the options and why you wouldn't spend a franchise tag on the outgoing players that we'll discuss. We'll break that down. But to start everything off today, let's look at the ways that the New Orleans Saints have to retain restricted free agent tight end Juwan Johnson, who is without a doubt, no argument, without a doubt, one of the biggest must keeps for the New Orleans Saints this off season. There were a lot of things that kind of, you know, led to, um, you know, Juwan Johnson having this really stellar 2022 NFL season where he basically had a career year bringing in over uh, 500 receiving yards, brought in seven receiving touchdowns as well. I believe it was the same number as DJ Moore. It was more than Mike Evans over in Tampa Bay. This guy had a fantastic 2022, and some of the reasons why that ended up being the case was because, well, this offense was one that ended up transitioning over to Andy Dalton, and Andy Dalton loves his tight ends, and he and Juwan Johnson had a fantastic connection all throughout the season, Uh, multiple games in a row, seven touchdowns over five or six games throughout the season. He was outstanding, and the other reason why you saw a lot of opportunity there is because despite the fact that Taysom Hill was supposed to be, you know, a receiving tight end and kind of moved into that role a bit more while still getting quarterback snaps. He spent a lot more time under center and at quarterback, which means there were a lot more of those tight end snaps to go around. Uh, Adam Troutman ended up uh, dealing with some injuries as well throughout the season. Uh, Nick Vennett, not really present, and then eventually off the roster. Uh, Lucas Krull didn't make it up to uh, the, the active roster until late in the season. So all in all, Uh, Juwan Johnson has this great year of seven touchdowns, 508 receiving yards on 42 uh, receptions. So he was very, very active throughout this year. So now that puts the New Orleans Saints in a situation to where you have uh, Juwan Johnson on an expiring contract heading to free agency and the competition could get a little bit rough in terms of keeping it around. But, but... There's a mechanism here that's going to help the New Orleans Saints out. Remember, Juwan Johnson came in as an undrafted free agent, which means that he will not be entering unrestricted free agency. He will be entering as as a restricted free agent when the new league year begins. So what does that mean? That means that the New Orleans Saints effectively will hold right of first refusal to any contract that Juwan Johnson gets offered, or what will more formally be referred to as an offer sheet, because you're not actually offering a contract. The reason why is because what the New Orleans Saints will be able to do is put down one of three tender options, T-E-N-D-E-R, not the app. Uh, <laughs> and with each of those tender options, the Saints are going to get the opportunity to be able to match an offer that might come from another team, even though Juwan Johnson will get the opportunity, as long as he's on that restricted free agent tender, to speak with other teams and all of that. So this is these are the three different ways that the Saints can make this all work out because there are three different options of tenders. There's the first, which is the cheapest, which is a right of first refusal tender. $2.6 million, we'll call it that. It's like 2.627, whatever. 2.6, we'll keep the numbers easy. That would give the Saints an opportunity for a team, let's say the Chicago Bears, right? 
And so the Chicago Bears come in and say, we want to offer Juwan Johnson this contract of X amount, two years, $15 million. I'm just throwing numbers out there. The Saints would get the opportunity to say, okay, we will match that contract and therefore Juwan Johnson would stay in New Orleans on that contract or they might say, we'll beat that contract and then give him a different, you know, they might give him two years, $16 million, whatever. That gives them just an opportunity at very low cost, very low risk to say, we want the opportunity to be able to match and so you get the offer sheet, bam, they match and then they can keep him around. The trick is though, with the right of first refusal, You don't get anything in return if you can't match the contract. That's where the other two tenders come in. There's a second round compensation tender, which is $4.3 million, and a first round compensation tender, which is $6 million. So what that would allow is that let's say that the Chicago Bears come in and say, we're going to give them four years, uh, $25 million or something, something like that, right? Then the Saints, or not, not 25, that probably wouldn't be enough. Let's call it like four years um, $40 million, right? $10 million per year. And the Saints kind of go, ooh, don't know if we want to match that. Mm, we're going to let him go. And then they let him go and sign with the Chicago Bears. And then the Saints would re- re- would receive in return, if they did the second round compensation tender of $4.3 million, a second round pick. If they do the first round compensation tender of $6 million, they get the first round pick. So if you're the Saints, what do you do? Do you do the first round compensation of $6 million and then understand that if you build a longer term contract, whether it be a short term contract or a long term contract, contract, and we'll break down the numbers of what those options would be on next week's No Cap Tuesday, because there's no cap, that would end up giving them, that would end up putting them in a, a little bit of a bind because anything that they did that came in at an APY of less than $6 million per year would get its nose turned up at it. So what the Saints will very likely do instead is invest the $4.3 million into a second round compensation restricted free agent tender and then work with Jawan Johnson on either a short or long-term deal that comes from that. Just to clarify, when I say short or long-term deal, when I say short-term deal, two years, one year. When I say long-term deal, three years or more. So think of this too as a potential placeholder only, right? Sometimes this isn't even about getting right of first refusal from the other team. It's about buying yourself time right? All right, here's the tender. Sign that. You're with us. Let's work on a long-term deal where we don't have, you know, this weird, you know, tender deadline or anything like that that they have to be concerned with. So that could be the way that the Saints go with all of this. But I think a second round tender, $4.3 million, makes a lot of sense because it allows them to create a long or short-term deal that is easy to eclipse that number in terms of average per year money and buys them time to get to that short or long-term deal. All right, coming up next, you're not going to use a franchise tag on Jawan Johnson, but could the Saints use a franchise tag on other players? I'll tell you why they're not going to as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. And today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the number one sportsbook in America. Absolutely, hands down. And I know the NFL season is over, but the NBA season is going and going and going. As we're coming back from the all-star break, stuff is going to heat up all around the NBA. Maybe you want to get in on a little bit of that action. FanDuel will help you do that. And especially right now, if you're a first-time user over at FanDuel, you're going to be able to get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's money that comes back to you if your first bet doesn't win, which means There's no losing on your first bet. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today. It's safe, it's super easy to use, and it's secure as well. And then you're going to be able to bet on everything from point scorers to money line to spreads to threes drain. And you can even string together a bunch of different things on same game parlays for an even bigger payout as well. So don't miss your chance for your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more, make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. New Orleans Saints have some expiring players on, you know, some players on expiring contracts, which are fit for the idea of a franchise tag, but 
it's very unlikely. The Saints don't use the franchise tag often. You remember the big sort of like litigation that came about when they used the franchise tag on Jimmy Graham years ago. They did use it on Marcus Williams back in 2021. And then, you know, we know how that all ended up. But <clears throat> for the Saints, going into this season, there's not really a lot of options for them. And so what you're looking for when it comes to a franchise tag target or candidate is a player on an expiring contract that has some level of status. Maybe they're a first round pick, maybe they're a consistent producer, maybe they're a star player, whatever it might be. So you see guys like Deron Payne over in Washington who becomes an option. You also look at star players like Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, Lamar Jackson, there's also Daniel Jones in, in, in a category. Those are the guys that you usually use those franchise tags on. For the New Orleans Saints, they don't have a lot of guys that are going to unrestricted free agency that are likely to receive a franchise tag. Now, remember, we were just talking about Juwan Johnson. Juwan Johnson would not be eligible for a franchise tag because he's going into a being a restricted free agent, not an unrestricted free agent. So if he were to play one year on a restricted free agent tender without signing a longer term deal, they could potentially use a franchise tag on him next year. This year, not going to be the case. If they were going to use a franchise tag on a tight end this year, it would be around $11 million. So you're pretty comfortable with the $4.3 million second round compensation RFA tender or the $6 million first round compensation RFA tender instead, right? You're talking about more than half or just over half of what that franchise tag amount is. So let's explore some of the New Orleans Saints' very limited franchise tag options, and we'll discuss why each of them are very unlikely to get the franchise tag. We'll start off with defensive end Marcus Davenport. We broke down what contracts for he and David on Yamada would look like in yesterday's No Cap Tuesday episode, so make sure you go and check that out. But doesn't seem likely you're going to uh, franchise tag Marcus Davenport. 19.7 million dollars is what the uh, defensive end franchise tag is in 2023. You're going to give that to a guy who had half a sack last season? No, I don't think you are. So I think you look at that from a production standpoint. You look at that from an injury standpoint. You look at that from a salary cap standpoint. $19.7 million. That would be great if you were franchise tagging somebody that just had 9, 10, 11 double digit sacks in 2022, but you're not. You're talking about a guy that had half of a sack. And that's it. So it doesn't seem likely that's going to be the case. Instead, what you're looking at when it comes to Marcus Davenport is the potential of extending him maybe into you know a short-term contract that's incentive-laden, hit this number of sacks, get this amount of money, hit this number of sacks, get this amount of money, because they would all be considered not likely to be earned incentives because he only had half a sack in 2022. And not to like beat a dead horse with that statistic, but that's very much the telling thing right here that, you know, if that was nine and a half sacks like it was a year ago, then we'd be having a very, very different conversation. If it was seven and a half sacks, we might be having a little bit of a different conversation and saying, yeah, maybe, maybe. Because remember, just like with the RFA tenders, the franchise tag tender can be used as a buying time mechanism, right? You're going to, we're going to put you on the franchise tag, but it just gives us time so that you don't become a free agent and go out there on your own and go out to unrestricted free agency and get a deal with another team. We want to be able to have our conversations without any interference franchise tag. Now let's work on an extension. That was part of what the, the, uh, Marcus Williams situation, um, uh, uh, was expected to be in 2021. Speaking of um, <clears throat> Marcus Davenport in the defensive line, we discussed that we were looking at his contract and what a potential extension for him could look like. We did the same thing for defensive tackle David Onyemata. David Onyemata is also an option for a franchise tag here. And maybe the most likely option if the Saints wanted to do something so that they could keep him around and extend their time to have a conversation with him about sticking around, especially right now when you're competing with Ryan Nielsen right across the division, all of that. But the Saints kind of have already done that, right? They went to Marcus Davenport and David Onyemata, who were set to have their you know contracts void. I think it was three days after the Super Bowl, and then pushed that back to March, and that gave them more time to be able to try to work on a long term deal, a short term deal, just something that's not you know them hitting free agency. So a defensive tackle franchise tag in 2023 is 18.9 million dollars, nearly 19 million dollars. So almost as much, not far off of the edge rusher. Uh, franchise tag, which is actually a little bit surprising, a little bit surprising. And the next number is even more surprising for the third player that we'll discuss. Promise you. Um, if Well, never mind. I'll explain it. So 
with David Onyemata, the, the reason why you probably don't see an $18.9 million franchise tag is because that's not a sum of money that you want to commit going into 2023 if you can't get a longer term contract done, whether that's a two year deal, three year deal, four year deal, whatever. That seems like something that you don't want to end up over committing if you can't get that deal done, because then you're just stuck with that on the books in 2023. You've got a quarterback to find. You've got an offensive line to help rebuild. You have the rest of the defensive tackle room to rebuild. The New Orleans Saints may not invest that much money in 2023 in their defensive tackle room by the time that it's all said and done as a whole, let alone one player. So it just seems unlikely that you're going to do this, even as a measure for buying time. It's just a lot of money to almost to, to, to commit even for a short amount of time as you roll into free agency. And it's even more kind of, you know, scary if that long term deal never gets reached. And then you just end up having a defensive tackle that's playing on a $19 million franchise tag in 2023. And now you have to figure out how to build the rest of the room around that and answer all of the other questions that are around. Last player that makes a lot of sense, and he is a must keep for the New Orleans Saints. It's linebacker Caden Ellis. Now, Usually I advocate for Caden Ellis to get anything he wants in the world. Totally fine with it when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. If he asks for it, give it to him. Wants a, a second locker next to his locker, bounce. That's Caden's double lockers now. Whatever he asks for, I, I say give Caden Ellis to keep him in 2023. But $20.9 million is not something that I would have said that I would say sit back and assess and go, yeah, that makes sense. Um, look. The New Orleans Saints play a ton, a ton of nickel and dime sets, meaning that they have oftentimes either two for the most part, or even sometimes just one linebacker on the field. So I do think keeping Caden Ellis in the building is really important. You might see more three linebacker sets next year, depending upon how the Saints go. You certainly saw it in 2022. But when you have Demario Davis and you have Pete Werner, who undoubtedly are going to be ahead of Caden Ellis in 2022, in 2023, at least to start the season, devoting nearly $21 million in one year to your third linebacker is a little absurd. Like, and it's, and the, one of the reasons why this linebacker one is so big is because of the contracts that you see that go to players that are designated as linebackers. These are all built off of the average points in terms of looking at other contracts at the position, top contracts at the position. So when you have Roquan Smith, who just got a you know historic deal, basically, that's why this franchise tag number boasts up. And then you also have a lot of players that come in as outside linebackers that get tagged as edge rushers or get tagged as outside linebackers because that price is higher. And so that ends up reflecting off-ball linebackers as well, who usually don't get paid the same amount of money as those on-ball pass rushing linebackers in stand-up sets of you know odd fronts and things like that. So, so the number gets a little bit skewed. It's an imperfect system here, though lots of things being done, of course, to, to make it as, you know, fair as possible and make sure that players who are getting tagged are getting what they deserve, especially as pass rushers. So while I, I, I think Caden Ellis is fantastic and I really, really, really hope the New Orleans Saints find a way to keep him going into 2023, $21 million in one year is not the way to get it done. So I think it's unlikely that the New Orleans Saints use a franchise tag on a player this year, but I also thought that in 2021 and look at what they did. They turn around and they franchise tag Marcus Williams. So we'll see what happens there. But it seems unlikely that it's going to happen. Okay. On Monday, here in New Orleans, the uh, New Orleans Saints actually in their practice facility hosted the HBCU Combine. And two players over on the offensive side stood out. And especially one of them could be of a particular interest to the New Orleans Saints. We got that as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrap it up today's episode of Locked on Saints. The New Orleans Saints helping to host the HBCU Combine. They'll also have the Legacy Bowl here in New Orleans, uptown at Yulman Stadium, where Tulane plays their football games. I'll be there for that, bringing you live coverage on Twitter, as well as, of course, bringing that information back here to Locked on Saints podcast. And there are two players that you're going to want to keep an eye out on as you watch it, whether you watch on NFL Network or wherever. It's like 3 p.m. on Saturday. Um, what you're looking at, the two two of the players that you're looking at had a really, really fantastic day at the HBCU Combine. I'm going to start with the guy that makes the most sense and could be drawing a little bit of interest from New Orleans Saints, who got an up-close and personal look as 30 of 32 teams showed up for the HBCU Combine. Of course, the New Orleans Saints were there as they were hosting the event. 
So the first player that really, really jumps out out of the two that had these sort of stellar days is Dion Galat. And you also hear him referred to as DJ Galat. He's a junior, DJ, Dion, junior. You get it. Um, Six foot one, 225 pounds, very good size. If you want a pro comp to that size, to those measurables, just talk about somebody else who's six foot one, 225 pounds, Jalen Hurts. Now, that's not really the combination or the, the comparison that you're going to make here, although there are some qualities that make a lot of sense. One of the things that really stands out about Golad is just how freaking smart he is. Now, he's also extremely talented. He has all the arm in the world. He can make any throw on the field, at least at the CIAA level. Competition, of course, is the biggest concern when it comes to any of these prospects uh, that are participating in like HBCU, uh, group of five schools, all of that. So what you're really looking at here are what are the intangibles? What are the things that he's able to do? You can look at the numbers. He completed uh, uh, 207 of his 337 passing attempts while he was with uh, the Bowie State Bulldogs last year. It was after transfer, after starting his career with Morgan State. It's a 61% completion percentage, 18 touchdowns thrown, 2,600 yards, 2,650, you can call it. Um 100 yards passing. And then he also added a you know, bunch of rushing statistics as well, uh, ran for 60, ran 64 times for 129 yards and two touchdowns. So didn't overvalue his legs, didn't become over reliant on his legs. And the reason why is because he's got a really, really good arm. And he's got a really, really good head on his shoulders as well. The shoulders up football is something that you're going to hear a lot from the New Orleans Saints over the course of the offseason when they're discussing interviews with players, what stands out about them on tape, things like that. So one of the things that really stands out about Golat when he spent his time, particularly at at uh, Bowie State, with offensive coordinator Matt, I think it's Gogans, maybe Goggins, not sure, um, but with the offensive coordinator there is that they kind of moved him from, you know, he's got some experience in like run option offenses and things like that. Bowie State said, here's a pro style offense for you. Go out there, get under center, um, identify the mic, call protections, change protections, change plays. Make those calls at the line of scrimmage, go out there, get it done with your arm. And that's exactly what he did. And he did it consistently. I mean, outclassing players out on the field. And you saw it in the Saints training facility on Monday, the arm, um, the the head on his shoulders, the interviews, lots of compliments about the the you know man that he is, all of those other things. And so one of the things that really one of the other pieces that really stands out when it comes to Golad is sort of having that like mentality of I'm a quarterback who's going to throw first, sit in the pocket, take what the defense gives me using my entire, you know, he uses his entire body in throws, even though he's got a huge arm. That was something that his offensive coordinator really focused with him on in terms of getting everything in there and then, you know, making sure that he's getting his entire body involved, making his throws more accurate, making some of the more difficult throws easier to make, things like that. And then using his legs when he needed to. And not steering away from it, but just allowing his legs to be a nice to have as opposed to a need to have, as my good friend Alex Clancy from over at Lockdown Cardinals said about Kyler Murray. And that's one of those things that really, really stands out about a guy like Golat. And that's one of the things that you also heard Jeff Ireland, New Orleans Saints uh, VP, assistant general manager, college scouting, does all these great things. One of the things that he said was he likes to dual threat quarterbacks, but he needs a dual threat quarterback that can throw when he can't run. And that's one of those guys that that's one of the sort of categories that you can throw uh, DJ or Dion Golat in. Now, the thing to consider here is that it's probably you're talking about a day three pick or maybe even an undrafted free agent, right? So probably not somebody that's going to come in and move the needle for you. You think about all the hype that was around Aquil Glass last year and Aquil Glass did not end up on a team, spent a little bit of time in Tampa across the division, but that's kind of it. So maybe the route for... Um, maybe the route for Golad is something that's a little bit more like going into one of these other leagues, the summer leagues, the spring leagues, things like that, and then potentially finding his way over to the NFL, maybe after some time. But hey, if you're in a situation here to where you're the New Orleans Saints and you've got Andy Dalton and you didn't get to you know draft a quarterback early that you really wanted to draft, and so you go out and you bring in another young, younger free agent or maybe even another veteran free agent, and then you just say, you know what, let's bring this young guy in so that there's another guy that's there, kind of the Jake Lutton of 2023, right, that just kind of rides the roster the entire time. 
He can absolutely be that guy for you and run your scout team, um, have this huge arm, and maybe he develops into something over time. Maybe he doesn't. The risk is super low there. So just a, a huge performance by him and somebody that I'm really, really intrigued to see on Saturday. Uh, another player that had a really, really fantastic performance at the HBC, uh, HBCU Combine, but but falls in one of those categories where it doesn't matter how good your measurables are, doesn't matter how or, or you know how good your your workouts are, doesn't matter how good your production was at the collegiate level, uh, at the HBCU level, you have to hit certain measurables in order to or the, sorry the NFL level, you have to be able to hit certain measurables in order to be considered right for the league, and that is Xavier Smith comes out. Wanted to prove to everybody that he could run, that he was a fast guy, that he could run routes, that he could do all these things. Did a phenomenal job with that. Timed some folks giving 4.8, sorry, 4.38, 4.39, maybe corrected into the four fours for a couple of folks. Um, Getting all of, you know, getting that speed out there helps his draft stock big time, helps put him on the radar forcing scouts to go back and look at his film. 87 catches, 1,021 yards, and 11 touchdowns last year as a wide receiver for uh, Florida A&M. He was an all-American wide receiver, by the way, go out an all-conference quarterback as well with the CIAA. But five foot nine, 179, 175 pounds. That's going to put a little bit of a cap along with competition level, along with are the eyes on you, right? By being at the HBCU level, which is always a big concern. It's one of the reasons why you see the NFL getting more involved in the um, you know HBCU combine, the legacy bowl, all that to try to help to bolster eyes on these young players. You're always going to have a bit of a ceiling on you, no pun intended, when it's that five foot nine, 175 pound guy, and and maybe you end up being, you know, a, a Deontay Hardy somewhere who goes undrafted, gets picked up, you know, shows your special teams value, and then maybe becomes something that you know uh, teams really love in terms of a a run after catch threat that they could utilize or deploy in certain situations. Look, every player in the every team in the NFL now needs a gadget player, and maybe this is one of those guys, along with like Nate Dell. You know, who could be a first round pick for all we know by the time this is all said and done because of the way that he's skyrocketing uh, up everybody's draft board. So we'll see what happens with Xavier Smith. Easy to get excited about that kind of speed, 438, 439, 44, any of that. Really, really appealing. We think about Rashid Shaheed last year who didn't get drafted. And part of the reason why he probably didn't get eyes on him is because he never got to run a 40. This guy did. So we'll see what that ends up doing uh, for his time. But you're going to see some HBCU players absolutely drafted this year. Isaiah Land and others also from Florida A&M. You want to keep up with any of those prospects, learn more about them, head over to Lockdown HBCU. Darian Gray has a phenomenal job. And hey, he's a Saints fan too. So go and show him some love for being a part of the Houdat Nation. In tomorrow's episode or on tomorrow's episode of Lockdown Saints, it's Thursday. So we're taking a look again at draft prospects. So let's Finally get to Stetson Bennett. Sorry, I haven't been able to do that quickly, but you know, we, we, we spoke about, you know, DJ Golat today. He's maybe one of those guys that falls into the same category as a Stetson Bennett, a Jaron Hall, a Lindsey Scott Jr. That's at the bottom of the draft, but that has a lot of tools that you should like. So we'll break all of that down for Stetson Bennett, but also discuss some of the big question marks around him as well and why he might not necessarily be the right fit for the New Orleans Saints, but let's break it down as we take a look at why he could be as well. Appreciate you as always for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we're free and available everywhere that you get your podcast. And for your second listen today, make sure you're going to check out Locked on NFL Draft, Peacock and Williamson, Locked on NFL, getting you up to date with everything going on around the NFL, especially with the franchise tag uh, window now open. Lots of news all over the place for you to uh, keep up with. So go and check them out. And I appreciate you as always for making me part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me say hi, thank you to Logan for saying hi over on the Zulu parade route earlier today. A really real, real pleasure uh, to see you and had such a fun time with the crew of Zulu as well. So if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter, Rosh Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you live and let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.